Next slide, which um, will now introduce our speaker for today. Uh, Dr. Tracy Green is an epidemiologist whose research focuses on drug use, opioid use disorder, and drug-related injury. She earned a Master of Science in Epidemiology and Biostatistics from McGill University and a PhD in Epidemiology from Yale. Dr. Green is currently Professor and Director of the Opioid Policy Research Collaborative at the Heller School for Social Policy and Management at Brandeis University. Previously, she served as Deputy Director of the Boston Medical Center Injury Prevention Center, Associate Professor of Emergency Medicine and Community Health Sciences at the Boston University Schools of Medicine and Public Health. She's an Adjunct Associate Professor at the Warren Alpert School of Medicine at Brown University, where she co-directs the Center of Biomedical Research Excellence on Opioids and Overdose at Rhode Island Hospital. Dr. Green helped co-found prescribe to prevent.org for prescribers and pharmacists and its companion site prevent slash protect.org for families, patients, and community organizations. She's helped design ASI-MB, uh, a real-time illicit and prescription drug abuse surveillance system developed by Inflexion, Inc. Her current work advances consumer safety for people who use drugs through preventative interventions, drug checking, and monitoring of the illicit drug supply. She serves as an expert advisor to the Rhode Island Governor on Addiction and Overdose and consults for the Center for Disease Control and Prevention and the High Intensity Drug Trafficking Areas on Public Health and Public Safety Opportunities. She served on the Board of Scientific Counselors for the CDC's National Center for Injury Prevention and Control and two recent National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicines committees pertaining to opioid pain management, regulatory strategies to address opioids, and medications for opioid use disorder. Her research is supported by the CDC, NIDA, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, Pecoria Patient Centered Outcome Research Institute, the Bloomberg American Health Initiative, the RISE Foundation, and the Department of Justice. Uh, so we are very pleased to welcome Dr. Green with us today. Thank you so much, Chris and Lisa, and for the introduction. Um, and I'm really glad to be here. Thank you, Kentucky, for the invitation. Um, I feel lucky to have been um, able to visit um, University of Kentucky a couple times. And um, and to see some of the wonderful communities and connect with some of the amazing people in your state. So I'm glad to share some of what we've been working on um, in Rhode Island and Massachusetts um, with you today. Um, first, though, I have to say no financial disclosures um, uh, for today. And we wanted to, um, and I wanted in this talk to address some practice gaps and educational needs pertaining to the pharmacy. Um, so as uh, articulated here, the pharmacy-based care needs are normalize the receipt of MOUD, and that can increase treatment engagement and reduce stigma and overdose. But most states um, that can allow for pharmacists to collaborate with prescribers, can, some can confer prescriptive authority or have other mechanisms to expand that scope of practice for pharmacists, um, might be a way to, to address the widening treatment gap for medications um, and provide greater equity. So some of the new data I'm going to share with you today suggests that it's possible, effective, and safe. So today, I want to dive in deeply to, um, object to get through these couple learning objectives. Uh, the first is to describe the rationale for addressing addiction care in community pharmacies and identify key characteristics of pharmacy-based addiction care in that model. To talk about some of the findings of our RCT um, that compared pharmacy-based addiction care to usual care, um, including some of our primary outcomes and, this, and study limitations. And then some, talk through some of these facilitators and barriers of implementing and sustaining pharmacy care models to address the opioid crisis. Um, there are a, a number of state and national actions that can expand scope of practice for pharmacists and pharmacy staff. So we'll discuss those and then think about some of the opportunities for continued expansion of pharmacist delivered clinical services. Um, so today, I hope you'll have a chance to learn about some of these things and um, think about prospects for these models, maybe in Kentucky or other places where um, you may be collaborating, and then um, think about those next steps for how this could be um, a more synergistic partnership with pharmacy. Um, so, but first, uh, a little bit about what, um, where I'm from. Um, I actually come from Los Angeles, from California. Um, I'm a New Englander at, at this time and live in Massachusetts and work in Rhode Island and Massachusetts and the region. Um, I sit at the Opioid Policy Research Collaborative uh, most days of the week in Massachusetts at Brandeis. And there we work to um, conduct research, build collaborative community engaged research platforms. And um, you can scope out all kinds of things that we're up to and my colleagues um, at the Brandeis Heller School too. So welcome welcome your partnership and exploration. 
Um, but to dive into the content, um, you know, we're we're here for for many of the data that you, you probably know way too well. In such short order, we've had um, dramatic rises in overdoses in the last decade, plus um, especially linked to synthetic opioids and um, this ongoing crisis that has expanded, um, touching every state and every community, um, and warrants direct action. That wide scale impact is really felt across the country. And um, this last July, the Kaiser Family Foundation conducted a unique um, health tracking poll. Um, you can see just in the middle of July, they ran this nationally representative um, survey to understand how addiction and opioid use has been affecting um, people across the country and gather input on, on particular policy initiatives. So one question in particular, I think, highlighted the, the reach of um, opioid use disorders and addiction in particular. And this really reflected that three in 10 people said that they know that they or someone in their family has ever um, had an addiction to opioids. And this was consistent across community types and across race and ethnic groups, um, really reflecting that um, our, our many communities and many groups of people are affected at this point and this tipping point suggests that we need to do a lot more to expand access um, to treatment and responses across the country and to more, more of our folks. But in particular, we've seen dramatic changes in the racial disparities in overdose death, which unfortunately do mimic some of the many conversations we've been having about um, other healthcare disparities, um, especially in Black and African American communities and our American Indian and, and Native populations. <clears throat> so the demographic and, and uh, information on the left panel is um, a wonderful and helpful study that looked at racial disparities in U.S. overdose um, rates and kind of compared to uh, the rates in deaths um, for white population decedents, what was the ratio or the ratio of the death rate um, for other demographics. And from this, you can see every state, um, Kentucky is just a little bit um, kind of below that um, dotted line where the national average is, but um, the circles are from 2010 and the diamonds are 2019. You can see the increase. Um, pretty much every state moved um, a very wide swath of green for non-Hispanic Black and orange for non-Hispanic American Indian Alaska Native, and the rate change over time. These disparities, even in the last um, data set released from, from um, the CDC on the right panel, shows that in a very short period of time, we're seeing increases in drug overdose rates that are profound in um, our minority communities even in one year's time. And this is not just reflected in overdose trends, but also important disparities in treatment, in prevention, in community safety, and also in harm reduction. Um, that more broadly and really openly, we need to think about our um, all of our approaches and all of our touches to people who are um, at risk of overdose and who might be using drugs in a, in a way that is harmful, um, and to look at the racial disparities in particular across all of the elements of, um, of response. So one, um, one orientation that's really important and I think has been exciting to see in the HEAL initiative and, and other um, places across the country with um, important investments from, our, from SAMHSA and from CDC um, is um, really centralizing the principles of harm reduction in our national response. And I'm speaking to this because it was very much a centering and motivating factor for why we approached this, um, approached the pharmacy and brought the pharmacy to this table as well. So the principles of harm reduction, of course, is a set of practical strategies and ideas that are looking to reduce the negative consequences associated with drug use. Um, and, and more broadly thinking about it as a social justice movement that is built on this belief that is that respect for people of the rights, the rights of people who use drugs is central. And this spectrum of strategies from safer use to managed use to abstinence to meeting people where drug users where they're at allows for a, a, a many different approaches. Um, and that addresses the conditions of how people are using along with the use itself. So a, a broader, um, in, in some terminology, the, the drug, um, the set and the setting as well are part of what we can intervene upon, upon and support in harm reduction. So the goal here is not um, no use, but rather improved health and functioning for the individual who's using drugs. 
And um, this sits really well with um, behavior change strategies that are known from our from the behavioral uh, and psychological literature that shows that there are stages of change that people go through as and, and they shift forward and backward um, and learn from each of the experiences they may have. Um, and so where people may be meeting people where they're at in pre-contemplation with no intention of changing their behavior or thinking about changing behavior and setting and, and context um, to preparing people for to making a change, to acting on that change, to sustaining the, to the change, to returning to how the change was not sustained and how we might be able to support them or what the system might be able to change to support change that is beneficial for the, the individual functionally improvement for the individual as well as um, helpful for the community. But these ideas that the stages of change are very consistent with some of the harm reduction principles. And this is how we can come to um, innovation and opportunity in providing harm reduction services that do um, recognize and adjust to stages of change, as well as incorporate harm reduction services um, and principles. So the kinds of services that um, harm reduction typically has um, been able to, in, in this country and in others, um, to advance um, dramatically are syringe service programs, naloxone access, low barrier medications for opioid use disorder, which is the focus of today's um, expansion through the pharmacy, and community drug checking, which I'd be happy to come back and talk with you about another time. Um, and this is um, alongside, not instead of, that larger cascade of SUD care um, that NIDA and others have um, advanced that recognize that there is um, an opportunity to um, address people at risk or who have, who have diagnosed SUD, to link people to interventions, to initiate treatment, to retain people in treatment, and to support them in recovery. This cascade of care is a very common place to invest, um, to track metrics, and to um, improve um, our, our innovations. And we know this is an important component because we have a ton of data that shows that medication treatment, buprenorphine um, and methadone in particular, um, have enormous benefits and with um, extensive primary evidence from across the world, as well as in our, our own backyards, um, including the reducing the risks of both all cause and overdose related mortality, um, reducing opioid use and cravings, um, injection in particular, that the risk of hep C and HIV are reduced, that improving access actually shows um, consistent improving access to medication treatment um, consistently in a program as well as in a wait list um, allows for overdose um, deaths to be reduced dramatically at the, at the aggregate community level. That increased social functioning and quality of life are improved by medication access, maternal and fetal outcomes, and that um, the harms are few and that rarely do we see overdose deaths that are associated with these medications, and in particular, um, buprenorphine. Um, but compared to our our colleagues across the globe, really we are missing it, uh, missing the mark dramatically. Um, these are data for across various countries in um, that maybe we would consider our peers, France, Norway, Germany, Portugal, the Un United Kingdom, Scotland and England, Australia, Denmark and Canada, specifically BC, uh, British Columbia. And in this, you can see the percentage of people with high risk opioid use or opioid use disorder who are receiving opioid substitution treatment or, or medications for opioid use disorder, primarily buprenorphine and methadone. And in this case, you can see that we lag at about 11% of that reach. The WHO set as a target 40%, um, and most of the countries that are displayed here are exceeding that. Um, so we are woefully inadequately addressing the in individuals that are greatly in need of um, care and attention. <laughs> The barriers to SUD care are dramatic um, from our at the provider level, the institutional level, the regulatory, financial, and, and patient engagement, all set within um, a extraordinary challenge of stigma and the stigma of drug use, the stigma of medication, and the stigma of care and help seeking. So recognizing that that is the case, um, and it's, it's also fair to share um, that we do know there are important limitations for medications for op opioid use disorder as we have implemented them that are here. Um, and that we know that the that only a third of the people who are who have um, opioid use disorder at any point are receiving any form of any form of treatment, not just um, 
medication. And as you saw, 11, 13%, if you will, um, are, is that reach currently. That right now, we are an exception to those colleagues um, that pharmacists cannot dispense methadone for opioid use disorder. Um, all the other countries represented here, pharmacists can. Pharmacists are not permitted to prescribe buprenorphine via waiver without state DEA authority outside of a CPA. Um, this is slightly changing, but um, we'll talk about that a little later. But other barriers and inequalities with respect to geography and insurance, um, the racism that we spoke of earlier continues and exists throughout the treatment system. And um, during COVID, we saw um, constraints on access to opioids and an unsafe supply um, and in increased substance use, especially with alcohol um, and changes in buprenorphine access that were more concerning. So we have in, in these important barriers to um, MOUD exacerbated most recently by our pandemic, the pandemic we've all been have, um, survived through. Um, but also, we are we have to recognize that there are barriers beyond stigma and beyond these institutional challenges um, that reflect criminalization and the pressure for abstinence-based models. Even when a system of MUD is implemented, that the policies are extremely prohibitive and restrictive, um, and the financial barriers if people can't afford the copay or the dispensing fee that's just, that's required to get a dose of methadone or to to pay a copay for a medication, um, and not to mention the lack of training and providers. So it's it is extremely bleak with this regard, but um, it's really important to also to to in this moment. The dimension of race and racism is really important to, re to reiterate that we know that from too many data points, um, especially recently, shining light on the fact that Black people have extreme barriers in every step of that cascade of care, from initiation for clinician visits um, to emergency department administration and prescription at that point, to pregnant Black people having less likely to receive MOUD than white pregnant people. And that's at start. Um, in maintenance, we see that Medicaid covered patients with OUD are less likely to be prescribed than uh, who, if they are black than if they are white. And we saw that COVID-19 in general decreased access to medications um, for um, black people compared to white people. And this uh, depicted here allows us to sort of see these trends in buprenorphine um, episode duration in the United States over time from 2006 to 2020 um, on the left and on the right with very big differences by race. So the kind of care, starting care, continuing care um, has incredibly different structural racist differences that we need to address. So how can we do better. <laughs> um, dismantling racism and creating a better access to care, um, professional associations that have come together and taken a stand to insist that there's better access, um, that we can do better as professionals. Um, and it's, it's sort of interesting, I think, to see this statement is coming from, and you can sort of see the, the letters behind there, the names, but really across um, professions, um, researchers, physicians, um, pharmacists, nurses, psychiatrists, all coming together to address these, inc these incredible challenges of our time and taking on a multidisciplinary approach. And if we are to do so, we'd be consistent with our great leadership in this country asking uh, for it to transform the provision of medications uh, for opioid use disorder for to a more universal approach, one that addresses education, increases access, creates the telemedicine, and I hope maybe some of you went to the open public comment today for DEA this morning on, on telemedicine, but to um, preserve telemedicine access, um, to ensure access for incarcerated patients that, that is consistent with the evidence base, um, and addressing SDOH, which is social determinants of health, to increase retention and recovery. And uh, uh, Dr. Gupta, of course, is um, a physician and um, the director of the Office of National Drug Control Policy um, and many of the other individuals there are leading the nation and thinking, helping to get us to think about universal treatment access. That would bring us a lot closer to our glo global partners. Um, that um, in the left picture is one that I took when I was in Scotland at a pharmacy um, where NHS had gathered. And just to remind people that you could get more than methadone at the pharmacy.
all of the things that are listed there are perfectly available. What I see is medications for opioid use disorder. I also see recovery supports. I also see harm reduction provision. I also see rescue medication, naloxone, which is actually why I was there in the first place. How do you do naloxone here? They pointed to the sign. We do all these things here because it's part of an integrated and comprehensive approach across multiple uh, sites, but the pharmacy being the one that I was focused on and that I'm like to share with you today. Also in there are housing supports. Not that the pharmacy was gonna sign you up for housing, but to connect you you could ask about, invite the opportunity to ask for housing support. It is a safe place to ask for housing support. This allows um, us to sort of see the pharmacy in a different way. Um, when we look to, for instance, how um, Australia has half of their community pharmacies provide MOUD, and 80% of patients who are on MOUD receive it from pharmacies as a directed focal universal component and partner um, that, of course, they're going to adapt to COVID-19 to take homes or to um, uh, telemedicine because it's part of the strategy and uh, the expected experience of treatment of MOUD in the community. So taking this all together in the United States, um, you know, I think there are a number of pharmacy advantages uh, for harm reduction and for drug use health and where um, I kind of call them in the four U's, if you will, <laughs> um, that pharmacies, as they present in the U.S., and I realize all of those countries have a, a different healthcare system and that maybe, you know, it's uh, completely universal care or access that's uh, insured. Um, it, this is true. Uh, however, there are still many things that are extremely useful by looking to how other countries and how other um, models operate, um, but looking deeply into how we provide pharmacy care and how it has presented in the retail pharmacy chain environment, the clinical pharmacy environment, the community environment and independence and otherwise. We see that pharmacies are ubiquitous, that most Americans live within five, a few miles uh, of a pharmacy, that they are undefined, that as a flexible space, that pharmacies can offer a wide range of services and many different products are available, um, whether that is, um, Specifically, dispensing medication is not the sole, um, in this undefined space is an opportunity, whether it's provided as a, a drive through or um, to be able to offer um, basic needs, uh, as well as medications at dispensing. This allows us a lot of room for redefining. They are unique. As a community embedded and locally adept partner, there is a unique space and place for pharmacy and underutilized. I think you, I'm, I'm trying to impress upon you that we have a major workforce problem when it comes to the grand challenge of our of our time with opioid use disorder and addiction. And uh, at this moment, we have uh, a workforce problem with prescribers um, not being able to meet the need of uh, the of those who may benefit from or would like to access treatment. And pharmacists are well trained; they're an underutilized healthcare professional in the community. And that is uh, across the board, but I think especially with respect to opioid use disorder. So it's a larger question, can uh, pharmacists as OED treatment providers? So in December, um, last December, Congress eliminated the buprenorphine, the X waiver, as we know, that prevented pharmacists from prescribing medications to treat opioid use disorder. And so now we have the opportunity where any practitioner that's authorized to prescribe um, Schedule Three controlled substances may now prescribe buprenorphine products for the treatment of OUD. So this should have opened the floodgates for anyone um, uh, or any of our prescribers to be able to prescribe de um, buprenorphine um, in this group. So DEA only permits pharmacists to register as controlled substance prescribers if it's allowed by the licensing state, however. So in this way, the states have quite a lot of in opportunity to be bold. And so um, it's very pleased with uh, um, this piece from Pew that reflected um, the words and views of one of our star pharmacists from our project that I'll talk about um, shortly. And um, so Andrew Terranova from uh, Genoa Pharmacy, uh, Genoa is the fifth largest, fourth, fifth largest um, chain pharmacy in the country. They're behavioral health pharmacy, specialty pharmacy, um, and they tend, their business model tends to co-locate with behavioral health providers um, and settings. So um, this is their jam, if you will. It was, they were a natural partner for our study that I'll share with you a little bit more about, but it was interesting to hear what Andrew had to say. 
Um, so Andrew says, my experience with patients showed me that many people seeking treatment face homelessness, stigma, judgment, and economic barriers every day. So coming into a pharmacy and being greeted by a pharmacist who wants to sit down with you and talk about being healthy was very much appreciated. He shared that the improvement that we saw in our interactions with patients and to feel their gratefulness for getting help in a way and manner they weren't used to was extremely rewarding. So um, when trying to see if this is something that's sustainable, that it was like, a, was this a one-off or not? But he showed, you know, we'd all be willing to participate again and continue what we started. So from the pharmacist perspective, it was exciting to hear from him um, what that meant. Um, my colleague who was the collaborative, collaborating um, practice agreement prescriber, one of two for our study, um, also shared, I think, very boldly this reflection, um, which I think has a lot of meaning, especially in the removal of the X waiver, um, with the challenge to physicians and prescribers. Um, but he shared what we have in this epidemic is a workforce issue. We don't have enough bodies prescribing buprenorphine. Physicians have had more than 20 years to go ahead and prescribe it for their patients with opioid use disorder, and the vast majority have said, no, thank you. Pharmacists are the most highly trained and underappreciated health professionals we have, and they are in the trenches. They see what's going on out there. We need them now, and apparently they're up for the task. So I was heartened to see in 2020 that the American Pharmacists Association House of Delegates accepted this action um, and these statements to um, circle around um, medications for opioid use disorder um, to sustain provision of, uh, of medicine as first line treatment for opioid use disorder and supporting these actions for as long as is needed to treat people's disease, um, to ensure access for patients, um, and then to, to really focus on equity and access and coverage for at least one medication from each class of medications um, to treat opioid use disorder. And then most recently in 2022, um, to advocate for pharmacists um, taking and more initiative, and we'll talk about this shortly, but in terms of an independent prescriptive authority of medications for opioid use disorder and um, to expand patient access to treatment. I think this was um, exciting to see from the pharmacist profession um, taking increasing steps, uh, acknowledging the importance of treatment, and then now really calling for um, pharmacists to be able to um, take more action in prescribing medications directly. Why that might have been the case might have had something to do with, a, with some of the data coming out um, from myself and from other studies um, showing that they it, that pharmacists can be trained um, to do so, that patients benefit, um, and that the, uh, doing so is safe, effective, and e improves equity. We'll hear more. But it's not perfect. Uh, so I think that having recognizing this is a potentially a pathway, we have to level set. MOUD access barriers in the pharmacy are real. Um, that even with prescriptive authority, we may still have challenges. We already know that several states um, and their studies that have documented a lack of naloxone, um, let alone buprenorphine availability. Um, uh, we've had a national study recently. Um, that looked to see uh, you know, called pharmacies and sort of seeker shocked, if you will, to find out if pharmacies had even buprenorphine in stock and 20% or one in five were unable to dispense buprenorphine. Um, this was critically in independent pharmacies and geographically the, re the Southern regions were really challenged with even stocking and having the ability to dispense and access buprenorphine, let alone be able to prescribe. Um, and then other limits that have been articulated, whether it's in wholesaler limits and DEA caps, um, the stocking and the cost for uh, the cost of stocking versus the customer demand. And clearly we have um, we have a legacy of opioid prescribing stigma um, uh, from prescription pain medications. And um, this is carrying over to medications uh, for opioid use disorder, especially buprenorphine. So the barriers are real. And I think if you haven't read this article, it's a really fascinating one of um, called uh, Red Flags and Red Tape, and it really reflected some of the challenges even with incorporating telehealth. So while telehealth introductions were really huge, um, and like we always say, 
if a, every prescription needs a pharmacy to dispense it. Um, and so telehealth improved, but pharmacies had to be able to recognize the telehealth um, prescription um, to sort through um, some of the geograph geographic challenges and some of the concerns that have, have haunted even in-person dispensing. And so challenges around um, introducing new models like telehealth um, sit within other barriers of being able to provide and access buprenorphine on the patient side and in the pharmacist side. So what's to be done? Well, a very uh, thoughtfully placed article um, from Cato and colleagues um, articulated some of the federal and state pharmacy regulations and some of the dispensing barriers to buprenorphine access um, at retail pharmacies. Um, and the idea and, and what was summarized in here were some um, articulated some goals, um, some actions that could be taken and, and pointed to responsible agencies who could act. And it's exciting to see some movement on each of these things. But, you know, importantly, um, it, for instance, um, ensuring that buprenorphine available availability at community pharmacies in response to the, the one in five not having such stocking, um, you know, actions such as requiring a minimum buprenorphine stocking or requiring wholesalers to ship buprenorphine orders without delay to pharmacies could be implemented and um, held accountable by DEA and SAMHSA, um, by the public health community and by state pharmacy boards. And in each of these kind of goals and possible actions, it's it's exciting to see that not that the responsible agencies aren't just federal ones. That the states um, are our communities have the ability to take action. And so, because state pharmacy boards you see uh, kind of bolded here are indicated at each point as a point of um, action, it really does show that um, connecting to um, state pharmacy boards is a critical um, structural approach for initiatives at the community level, um, at the research level. And otherwise. <clears throat> On the pharmacist side, what does that mean for buprenorphine? Like, how could it, how could this work? Um, how could pharmacists, um, what are the mechanisms by which an inpatient pharmacist, an outpatient clinic, and a community pharmacist could take um, and improve buprenorphine access, <clears throat> lacking the prescriptive authority as it is? Um, but on the inpatient side, even in, I just bolded a few places, but I, identifying currently hospitalized buprenorphine candidates and ensuring access to treatment, um, continuing buprenorphine during hospitalizations are things that inpatient pharmacists can do to improve access to medication and create a standard of care within a, an inpatient setting, right? Outpatient clinics that could um, incorporate and advocate for it. So pharmacists could have a role in making sure that um, telehealth is preserved um, and telehealth is um, continued and um, and advocating for continuing um, access to prescription and pharmacy filling in collaborations that are um, that ensure that buprenorphine is stocked and buprenorphine can be can be dispensed. Um, being an advocate to educate other staff and in, in clinics about what buprenorphine is. So you become kind of an ambassador of um, what this medication is and how it works. Pharmacists are used to working and talking with the community, and this is a really important role. And then finally, um, on the side of community, um, really making sure that um, there's opportunities for uh, easier access to starting treatment and connecting to care in the community when people do start. These are opportunities for pharmacists at the individual level to be involved. And in doing so, we really preserve the dignity of people who use drugs and people with, with opioid use disorder to gain access to high quality care. Um, and um, so just moving into what does it mean then to be a provider status and to have, um, so aside from those possible advocacy points or possible involvement at, at an institutional or professional practice site level, um, retooling how pharmacists could be involved in medications for opioid use disorder in a more active way requires a revision of provider status. And this language um, is really important to learn um, if you're not as familiar with. Um, so I'm going to talk about provider status and the components of provider status. Um, what this means um, the, has some historic origins related to designating pharmacists as non-physician practitioners in Medicare Part B. And that would really allow ph pharmacists to seek reimbursement for covered services and for Medicare enrollees. So care that they may be providing to a Medicare enrollee um, to uh, be able to 
to um, as those services increase, that pharmacists would be able to um, be, be paid and be compensated and reimbursed for their efforts. More generally, though, um, as people talk about provider status, is really um, a, a more gestalt term to talk about the capacity for ensuring that patients have access to clinical services that pharmacists are able to provide, and ensuring that pharmacists are adequately reimbursed for providing those non-dispensing clinical services. So a dispensing fee, and if, if you do finances on the um, care provision side, you may see the pharmacist has a dispensing fee, and it's a very small amount for dispensing that particular medication, for literally preparing and safely making sure that the patient is getting the medication they're supposed to be receiving. The counseling, the care, the other things about um, ensuring that there's um, a safe and, um, and a counseled experience is not um, clearly articulated and uh, not properly reimbursed. And so the opportunity to um, expand pharmacy um, provision of care services means that we have to revisit what it means to be a provider of care services. Um, so the provider status is both payer recognition as a healthcare provider so that they're eligible to be reimbursed for, for patient care services if, if it's provided to um, to um, definition and quality as, a, as appropriate, and that there's a scope of practice framework that has, allows for pharmacy professionals to deliver clinical services at that to the height of their education training. So practicing at the top of their training as the scope of practice is what it's referred as. And then payment mechanisms for pharmacists provided patient care services and, and, and equ equitable reimbursement for services that are, are rendered. So these together, like the combination, if you will, or the place where they all meet, where we there's billing, there's recognition, and there's scope of practice, and uh, equity and payment is what people refer to where we think of as provider status. And those are the conversations that need to be had um, at multiple levels and in every state to align and to adjust to what we are, are seeing and doing. We've done this before when we said we really want pharmacists to help out with the COVID-19 vaccination delivery. And before then, we really wanted them to help out with um, influenza vaccination. And in doing so, places that have revisited the provision of care and the ability to pay for these services and changing the scope of practice to be able to administer medications like this or, or um, uh, immunizations, that these are small ways that the provider or a vision of what the provision of care and a vision of what a pharmacist can, does, and will do um, is shifting. And uh, this is true about nurses, it's true about um, pharmacists, it's true about um, physician assistants, and we are continuing to have uh, a re-envisioning re healthcare, and it's a very healthy thing for our society to do. Coming out of a major pandemic, I'm not surprised that there is a more impetus to revisit how we do things, because we just had a major reset as, as, a, as a species. So what are some ways that we can do it right now? Um, I'm going to introduce you to um, a couple different models, um, the, the legal and policy ways of doing this. The collaborative practice agreement is the one that I'm most familiar with. And a little spoiler alert, this is what we did in Rhode Island. Um, it may be what other states do. Uh, Kentucky may not do this, but we'll have to see. Um, but the collaborative practice agreement is a model, um, that uh, legal model that allows for the establishment of a formal relationship between a prescriber and a pharmacist. And in articulating specific patient care functions that the prescriber delegates to the pharmacist. So there may be specific action verbs that are in actions that are articulated in that collaborative practice agreement or CPA. And then the last part is really the negotiated conditions. So um, after this act, notification will be made promptly within 24 hours to the EMR or to the whatever. Like those sort of negotiated conditions are um, specified in a collaborative practice agreement. The mechanism of being able to do this exists in nearly every state in the country. So others though have um, other approaches, but thinking about a collaborative practice agreement, um, what are the kinds of things in the element of um, articulating um, and a policy, what might that look like? For MOUD, an ideal policy, and lined it up in the middle, and an example of a state policy, this is kind of an amalgam of different states, um, kinds of things that we would typically see with respect to a collaborative practice agreement. Um, might there be site restrictions? An ideal policy would not. Um, a, a sample state policy, such as where I live in Massachusetts, um, 
because CPAs or collaborative practice agreements are only permitted within a hospital or an institution. No community pharmacies may have a physician uh, or a prescriber, if you will, and pharmacy collaborative practice agreement. It can only happen within a hospital. Provider types. Ideally, this would be all people, all types. Anyone who can prescribe should be able to have a collaborative agreement with a, pro with a pharmacist. Um, in some states, it's only physicians. This was the case in Rhode Island. So our NPs and APRNs and PAs off the books, though they could prescribe. Um, and at the time we were under a, the data waiver, that was fine. Um, however, they could not engage in a collaborative practice agreement. Only the physician could. This is not an uncommon restriction. Number of pharmacists and prescribers on a single CPA. Ideally, there is no limit so that any pharmacist at an institution um, signing on to a CPA with that prescriber can engage in that CPA. A typical um, restriction may be that oh, it's limited to only one for one, one prescriber and one pharmacist. And every time you write another agreement and another agreement and another agreement. Does the Board of Pharmacy have to approve? Um, each of these, ideally, not every CPA, as long as it fits to a, a, a set of requirements. Ideally, the Board of Pharmacy doesn't have to approve and meet and review each time. Um, other places, um, they may have a state policy that requires a fee associated with it. So the Board of Pharmacy uh, meets and you have to pay for each application. Um, prior establishment of a patient prescriber relationship is required. So do you need to already have that the patient's already with a prescriber before you can engage a pharmacist in being a collaborative care partner? Um, ideally, no, that it need not be um, that, the, that they've been a long-time care provider, that instead the pharmacist and um, and could be the first time contact um, instead of having, or, or that the if a physician um, left a practice that um, they may be able to be cared for for the by the pharmacist if they have a CPA in uh, in existence, for instance, with a new prescriber. So other qualifications for pharmacists, you know, any licensed pharmacist in good standing would be able to be part of a CPA. Um, and then other state examples for where there may be barriers, um, ask, asking for specific advanced training in a particular topic or requiring that um, certain um, residencies be applied. These are some examples of how um, an ideal policy, especially for MOUD, could be written. And that's really what we took into, for instance, in Rhode Island. So as an example, in Utah, um, you know, this, these 16 and 17 articulated here allow for a collaborative practice agreement for a pharmacy to engage one or more pharmacists um, agreeing jointly or on a volunteer basis to work in conjunction with one or more practitioners under a protocol whereby the pharmacist may perform certain pharmaceutical care functions authorized by their practitioner or practitioners under certain specific specified conditions or limitations. And it's written, um, signed, and you can kind of get a sense of what the CPA might look like. The other side of the pharmacist access is in having the pharmacist be prescriber, and legislation can um, allow for a pharmacist, um, 10 plus states are in um, this direction of allowing pharmacists to prescribe directly, either specific drugs or classes of drugs, um, therapeutic substitutions, continuing therapy, um, specific conditions for those treatments. Um, and this means that um, independently, pharmacists can prescribe, so they have the ability to, uh, for a licensed pharmacist, to issue a valid prescription, and that prescription is written in the pharmacist's name. And so they need not delegate or be supervised or have oversight from a collaborating provider, a prescriber. And dependent prescribing is much like what a collaborative practice agreement would be, where the name on the prescription is not usually that of the pharmacist, but of the collaborating prescriber. And they would have um, the opportunity to, um, they would be reviewed or um, that would be specific delegations. So it's just dependent prescribing. So you can kind of see across where um, uh, physicians, sorry, pharmacists are permitted some form of independently prescribing at least one drug or device. Uh, for MOUD, it's a little bit more restrictive. About 10 states are able to potentially do this. But pharmacists prescribing examples, whether it's naloxone or um, uh, different approaches for tobacco cessation medications, these sort of examples exist. So doing something like um, buprenorphine prescribing is not uncommon, or it wouldn't be without um, precedent. 
and the kinds of standards of care for prescribing, like this example from Idaho, are articulated in um, the requirements at the state level and then would be provided as, um, as uh, specifically documentation for a particular condition or prescribing situation. So what do we do in Rhode Island? Um, we've got some background on some of these models. We carried out a um, pharmacy care model that started out with just maintenance. And when the pandemic happened, um, we started to see some problems in the trends of buprenorphine dispensing across the state that were worrying. And um, specifically that induction was um, becoming extremely difficult, that um, patients were not able to start medication, that they were... Um, unable to, the, the physicians were not taking on new patients, they were uncomfortable with telemedicine, they did not want to start people over the phone, and they certainly were not doing anything inpatient. So um, the age of um, unobserved induction or take-home induction really began in, in our state to take shape. Um, so too did a 24-hour buprenorphine, 24-7 buprenorphine hotline. Um, but before then, we started to think about what else could we do to provide access. And for the longest time, we were trying to build out our maintenance um, provided pharmacy care model to consider, couldn't we start patients? This seems like it's just a little shift in what we've been doing. So we built that out and I'll share a little bit more about that, but it was built on, um, we did this because we had and carried out a collaborative practice agreement that was approved by our Board of Pharmacy, our Board of Medicine, and signed by the Department of Health Director. Um, and we were, as part of that, we were carried out extensive training and um, provided ongoing communications with our pharmacy team. We um, adapted alongside and in partnership with the American Society for Addiction Medicine. Their um, CEs, CME on buprenorphine, they're four and four, if you will, four online and four in person, um, to pharmacies and pharmacists environments. So this covered everything from the kind of documentation, kind of testing, um, motivational interviewing. We also touched upon harm reduction. And because we were the first state in Rhode Island to have statewide medications for opioid use disorder on the inside in our correctional setting, um, we had a large number of people leaving the prison jail systems on buprenorphine that um, were falling out of care. And um, we felt that the pharmacy should be prepared for and be supportive of and have understandings of criminal justice involved individuals, uh, partially because we have an enormous probation parole um, and oversight um, uh, for people who are in community supervision, but also because of the sensitive nature of post-release um, and, and great risk. So um, we also trained on stigma reduction and communications. So we started out with seven pharmacists in May of 2018 doing trainings like this, um, did another wave of nine um, pharmacist trainings. And then as people um, were joining throughout the study, um, we did um, train another five. So we had 21 pharmacists in total who are trained. And then we provided them ongoing supports and detailed them with um, providing weekly phone-based meetings if they wanted, um, clinician check-ins, kind of direct to the prescriber, if you will, uh, on the collaborative practice agreement prescriber discussions, and then we academic detailed the sites to make sure that they had what they needed um, on site and provided encouraging um, newsletters to share site stories from, from the, if you will, from the trenches. Um, but we thought and saw that um, the literature was really showing that low barrier buprenorphine and take home starts, um, if you will, um, for an unobserved induction would um, help rich achieve remission and lead, uh, lead help people live improved lives if we could kind of meet people where they're at by providing lower barrier to entry. So our whole model of medication first was what we were practicing in the maintenance setting, but many people had been on buprenorphine for years in our study. Um, so could they continue their care for three months at a pharmacy? It started, it, it was working really quite well for them. What we weren't sure about was, um, could we provide induction? And in the COVID-19 era, in addition to induction, we saw people experiencing great withdrawal um, needs. And um, so we innovated a, two things, a treatment protocol that allowed for um, withdrawal treatment. Um, so one dose of buprenorphine or that the patient would be assessed by a pharmacist. They would just be dispensed um, 24 hours of medication and that the dosage was dependent on the severity of their withdrawal symptoms. So while our pharmacists were trained already to administer a COWS or a, a clinical opioid withdrawal scale and assess withdrawal 
at that moment, um, if individuals were in too great of a withdrawal, instead of starting um, at that time, if they are uncomfortable, um, we could provide and, and did not want to start on um, ongoing um, treatment, that they could be provided withdrawal supports to relieve their suffering. And um, because buprenorphine is um, indicated for the treatment of withdrawal, and that was part of our CPA, the treatment of withdrawal in, in one dose of buprenorphine was consistent. Um, in addition, we adapted to have the ability to induct patients. So again, the patient was assessed by the pharmacist. They spoke to the provider to verify the induction regimen, and the patient began the treatment off-site on their own time. And um, this was COVID sensitive as well. Um, and the protocols are, when we started the withdrawal protocol, um, and develop them. We had not envisioned this as part of the study at all. Um, and uh, there was no, in, in this uh, protocol, there is no need to call the prescriber because the symptoms are acute and they can uh, be identified in the pharmacy directly. Um, so for ongoing care and facilitated induction, um, there was a prescriber directly connected and um, on the left side, if you will, the cows were required to be within eight to 36. Um, and on the right side, the facilitated induction, the cows could be um, a much lower range of zero to 24. So mild to moderate withdrawal. And um, and they were able to self-treat their, um, and, they, had to be in, and um, they could be self-treating OUD using non-prescribed buprenorphine. Um, the importance of um, having us, like the telemedicine and withdrawal changes, sorry, the telemedicine and DEA um, controlled substance prescribing regulations that shifted during COVID made all of the induction possible because it meant that we had no in-person assessment um, that was otherwise required and there was no heavy video requirement. This meant that a patient could literally walk into the pharmacy and say, I'd like to start buprenorphine today. And they could leave within an hour. We had some paperwork because it was a research study, but they could leave within that period, a very short order um, with medication to start to start their journey. We borrowed heavily from um, the wonderful people across this country who have been pioneering this work um, to clearly convey, and the pharmacists were trained to clearly convey things like um, how, when to start and how to start, um, ha, how to self-assess their own um, start moments at where, wherever they were starting, and communicating um, from the pharmacist's um, perspective, those were very comfortable places to, to be, talking about medication and what to look for, different um, side effects and uh, when to call. But then also this was very clear to us that we needed to find out what their other needs were. <laughs> um, especially during the middle of COVID, we felt um, an enormous um, ethical responsibility, uh, which was there to begin with, but especially at this time, to find out if they had other needs. And as a study, we were able to provide them. So we assessed um, in the next seven days their need for food, phone, safe medication storage, insurance coverage, um, if they needed COVID-19 testing, if they had housing needs, um, naloxone and sterile syringes. And we were channeling that poster in Scotland, hanging up and reminding us that there's more to the care of buprenorphine and, and this treatment moment to um, center around the needs of the individual. Um, more immediate needs of the individual. And um, and then to support if people were already having ongoing um, counseling appointments or um, peer support connections to support that and remind them um, the next time they had a touch point and encourage and check in on these. So this was the sort of documentation and provision that were available to the patients. Their instructions um, on day one, two to seven, uh, on day five, these protocols were all modified from the California Bridge Treatment Model. And we, we generated a medication guide for buprenorphine um, for the study and um, for communicating directly to the patient. So they could go um, to start off with um, supports. Then finally, they talked to our research team to make an appointment for a baseline assessment. Um, and then we, the pharmacy team filled and dispensed medication in the name of the collaborative practice agreement provider, and then did the, those counseling for next steps. 
For our study, what did it all look like? Um, eligible patients were 18 or over, had a history of opioid use disorder, uh, or opioid use rather, and were on treatment or interested in MOED. So they did not have to have um, prior treatment. And as they presented to the pharmacy or a clinic, uh, they walk in the pharmacy, they could have even come through the emergency department, which was which were completely overwhelmed at that time for COVID cases. Um, so as a triage, it was um, an opportunity to also provide um, direct access if someone was looking for um, starting um, MOUD, the, the ED could push to or encourage and support um, access at the pharmacy. And then we also did street outreach um, and connecting with our harm reduction partners to um, let them know about the opportunity to start at the pharmacy if people wanted to. And then we screened, um, and as I mentioned, if they had no withdrawal, um, they could start um, with facilitated home induction if they were interested. If they had mild to moderate withdrawal, they could either do a bridge regimen or do a withdrawal treatment. Um, and then we would um, allow for counseling and refer them to when they're ready for facilitated unobserved induction. And a more severe withdrawal um, cow score would have um, uh, indicated a need for a 24 hour heart line and or starting the withdrawal support treatment. In our study, we had no one in that category. Diagram. This is a little boring, perhaps, to see. Sorry about that. But we were assessing uh, 171 individuals for eligibility. We consented 100, um, and then we randomized um, 58. Um, the individuals who went to standard of care and treatment um, were then followed up for 30 days, and then we analyzed and compared the 30 people to the 28 people. Um, and the what we learned um, in providing pharmacy care induction. Um, that we had a high induction rate, that we had high engagement, and that was greater than what we'd ex what we observed in usual care. And um, looking to our at the time our other community provider settings, um, not just our usual care group, but also usual care in the community to date um, had similar rates of of engagement. So what did we find? That 58 percent, uh, so 100 were started, 58 uh, percent were stabilized and had two or more pharmacy visits and then enrolled uh, in the maintenance phase. That initial engagement in care for, M for MOUD um, was greater for, for, for folks who were um, pharmacy inducted than usual care. So we had 89 percent who um, came to the pharmacy were continued on for their MOUD visits and 17 percent um, from usual care group continued on. So um, in maintenance, and this has not been published, but is under peer review. So I put that um, provision out there though, as we continue to see um, the individuals who continued on to a maintenance care environment um, that we still saw kind of a dominance or if you will, a greater engagement in pharmacy, people who are randomized to the pharmacy care um, continued on in compared to the usual care. So in terms of engagement and ongoing um, support for MOUD engagement and care, we did see greater increases and in sustaining in our um, pharmacy arm compared to usual care. At the time, uh, we also were tracking, um, because it's a randomized control trial, we looked at deaths and unanticipated severe adverse events. We had um, none, um, and we a positive was um, 33 individuals who were inducted um, were dispensed naloxone. The ones who were not either had it already um, or, or had it on their person or had it at home. But who was um, part of this and why is, I began this really, talking a lot about the need to think about racial and, and um, ethnic disparities. To this, we saw um, in, in this particular group that induction really spoke to and was effective in and engaged people of very diverse backgrounds. The individuals who we are, who were engaged in the induction portion of our study and, and continued on were, um, Obviously, they were inducted. They weren't already in treatment. So what we saw was a much greater involvement of people who were um, interested in, in continuing care, who are from BIPOC backgrounds, um, similar from our Hispanic community, but many of the individuals involved in the induction, uh, pharmacy induction portion were unhoused and had no reliable access to a vehicle. They were um, recruited mostly through outreach and word of mouth. Um, many were unemployed at the time, disabled, had experienced overdoses, um, were primarily using multiple substances um, other than opi certainly opioids. And fentanyl is the drug um, that has settled into our community. 
And most of them had previously had buprenorphine use, especially through prescription pathways, but also non-prescription pathways. And at induction, um, they were in really mild withdrawal. So it's, it could have been assessed at that time um, and started as we were able to. And by the end of the study of 90 days, there were 334 visits to the pharmacies, 14 touch points. They had 43% of the participants did use some form of study transportation, um, had a, received a phone, we provided a phone. And um, surprisingly, I think, but thankfully to our study, we were able to provide um, payment assistance for the first month. And um, that is because a lot of people couldn't either afford or did not have insurance. And we could assist them in that pathway as another social determinant of health to address. And because, as I mentioned, um, there were zero deaths. Um, we did have hospitalizations um, at this time because of COVID. We did have many non-substance related um, and the, there were no differences in groups um, for the number of ED visits. Um, it's slightly, uh, the p-value was not significant, but borderline, if you will, for um, the number of hospitalizations being lower in the pharmacy group. But the voices of the people, I think, reflected the most um, helpful guidance for maybe why this model could be meaningful. Um, and this was, I'll just read them aloud, um, a patient said, I felt comfortable to bring my babies to the pharmacy for visits. I never felt embarrassed going there. The hours were perfect for me. It was even better than I thought it would be. It was quick, easy, clean. People were so nice, not out of my way at all. A very easy thing to do. It's very convenient. People are happy and look like they like to be there. It was a nice environment. It was the same thing. No surprises, on schedule, easy to do. That's exactly what I wanted. I was excited to go to the pharmacy. I met with the pharmacist. I don't get to sit down and talk to someone like I do at the pharmacy when I'm at the OTP. Many of our, our patients, um, should say, uh, are dispensed buprenorphine through the OTP. That's a, a major pathway for um, in Rhode Island. The study pharmacy was more courteous, friendly, and more personable uh, than just going to a large retail chain pharmacy to pick up medication. I didn't have to stand in line and have people in my personal space. So who are these patients? You saw a little bit, uh, but who, who, for whom did it work? The 58 patients who were, um, who continued to, um, conti who continued into um, induction, who were they? Turns out um, many of them had a chronic pain condition of some form. They stated that they had a healthcare provider that they could go to for care, but uh, clearly were not getting buprenorphine through them. Um, they perceived and sought out supplies or services at the pharmacy. This I thought was fascinating. So they either get, have gotten OTC medications there prescription, uh, sorry, uh, for a headache or for anything else, that they saw the pharmacy as a place where they could get services and had been serviced in the past by them, whether it was medication management, but especially OTC medications. But otherwise, we really didn't see any differences. It wasn't um, associated with, with that induction worked for any particular group better or worse. There's a small sample size, so it's important to replicate, but um, that the fact that that didn't really shake out, that these other components were more important, speaks to something more fundamental, a need that is being met. So sort of in conclusion, we see the patients who are inducted in the pharmacy attain st stabilization that was comparable to our community-based usual care providers, that pharmacy-based induction promotes racial and economic equity and medication treatment access, that transitions that are imposed by, st by studies um, like ours that are other systems of care and engagement and care that disrupt that engagement um, is inappropriate. Us having to move people back to a care provider was heartbreaking for at the end of our three months. Uh, pharmacy should be able to maintain care in the pharmacy. If you start in the pharmacy, you should be able to continue in the pharmacy if that's your choice. And when you're ready to move to a clinician in the community, you should move to the clinician in the community. But the, the medication space that's working for you is the place that should be continued. Um, we still need more research, and I'm not saying this just because I'm a researcher, but because I think it needs to, we, the combination and level of, of peer, we didn't have as much peer support. I would have loved to have had more. Um, COVID did disrupt a lot of this, but other material supports um, that might be helpful to optimize the rates of induction and um, to maintenance um, for these kind of models. But there's a lot to work with here. But I can't say that it's perfect because there are important, important check factors that um, may, may affect the CPA implementation. So certainly it highlighted here provider status and payment for services. We have having the darndest time for every CPA, not just for medications for opioid use disorder, but to be paid and re reimbursed appropriately. 
Is it, if, if you have a CPA, is that 34, 30, 30, 70? Is it 50, 50? Who, uh, whose responsibility is it? Um, and then different buprenorphine rules at the state level. There's a lot to work through here at the systemic level. Um, and then on the CPA side, um, billing for things like lab tests and um, how many pharmacists and pharmacies who's signing for the prescription that are specific, that are implementation um, components that will affect um, whether um, for, for us, we wanted to be able to, in, in Rhode Island, we wanted to be able to administer now Trexone, for instance, not even the new long acting injectables are super exciting. Um, to be able to do that, we had to change the law um, to be able to administer um, medications. Um, now that's possible in Rhode Island. So we'll see what happens. Um, but before, these are the kind of specific things in a CPA that need to be worked through for, um, for changes. But is there hope? I think there is. Um, there's lots to work through. We're good at this. We humans, we can come together and talk through. But um, just returning to our survey from this summer, um, we, I thought it was really, it, this spoke to me. This question in particular was, at, was posed, um, you know, 1,700 Americans, representative sample of the country, who... Um, were asked, um, in order to reduce drug overdoses, do you support or oppose? And you can see the colors, uh, um, the dark blue and the uh, royal blue reflect um, somewhat support for some of these things. And um, you know, I think the first one in particular reflects a shift in um, there are remnants of stigma that they're still strongly opposing and somewhat opposing green points there, but there's an awful lot of blue. There's an awful lot to be thinking about that people are um, supporting addiction treatment centers in your community. If those are pharmacies, um, that's where I'm sort of sitting, that there's a lot of interest and support for better treatment access and a recognition that we could do better. So this map is just of where um, pharmacists can currently prescribe directly um, for MOUD. Um, so maybe some actions will be taken um, with some of our work and, and that of others in the future. Um, but to look to, um, since uh, I was asked to do this, um, uh, the state of Nevada passed Assembly Bill 156 um, and was signed by their governor into law this summer that authorized pharmacists to prescribe MOUD um, with the statewide protocol. Working that out and um, implementing it into 2024 will be super exciting as a state that suffers from rural healthcare challenges um, and big city problems as well in um, Clark County. Um, we have an opportunity to see some real innovation in access to MOUD in the pharmacy level. So stay tuned and maybe other states will, will join this pack. Um, and thank you very much. I'll pause here so we can talk and take some questions. Oh, there's some media links. Uh, I'm sure these will be passed around. So I'll um, share that. Well, th firstly, Dr. Green, thank you so much for sharing all this information in this novel um, innovation model that you all have, have come up with. Um, so if I just want to make sure everyone has an opportunity to ask questions please feel free to take yourself off mute, to put questions in chat, um, to raise your hand, to send us a question directly, and we'll be happy to uh, address any questions that anyone has. Um, as people start to think through their questions, I'm I'm just curious, you know, thinking through all these different regulatory aspects to be able to do this. Like where, what, where did you start <laughs> for implementation for, for the program in Rhode Island? Um, well, I did look out in that um, we I've been working with partially because of naloxone access um, in the state. We learned a lot about how naloxone could be provided in the pharmacy. And, and if people are working in this space, um, if you can kind of find that constellation of people who kind of revisited these questions, because a lot of the same same um, concerns around this medication is unusual. It's is it you know, um, how and where and what will pharmacists be able to do? And that constellation of people um, would be a great place to sort of, uh, they know where to look in the regs, you know, and they know it might be need to change. But also um, the Pharmacists Association at the state level was really helpful. And um, I had um, wonderful leadership with Jeff Bratberg um, from the URI College of Pharmacy. Um, 
I will say I'm not a pharmacist, but I play one on TV. Um, that I, but it, as a scientist, you know, we we all we do this as a team, and I think as a community engaged pharmacist, that team includes people who use drugs and organizations in our community working in recovery, um, and our state agencies to kind of see how what were the you know do you think we could do this or how can we do this and finding finding the right groups to um, to bounce ideas around. Um, but the I think since this study has come out, there's a, a lot of momentum, I think, around um, there has been a lot more momentum at the national and then on some of the state levels to figure out what what's what's the deal in our state? Could we do it this way? Could we do it that way? Um, and what might you know, what's the vision? Our vision was uh, very medication first as low barrier as possible. Um, and we wanted to be able to to. Um, to build out, you know, everything from withdrawal to induction to maintenance, um, you know, every state's comfort level and needs may be, may be different, but um, so that was a, that's a great starting place though, is finding associations and, and schools of pharmacy are hugely helpful. Great, thank you. I'm also just curious of the, the, I know that you all adapted protocols from things like Bridge, but I was curious if those protocols that you were sharing that you all came up with, are those like part of the publications or part of like a, online guide for for states or for people that are at a point where, where they would be wanting to implement a similar program yes actually the, i've never done a publication i've never done a research paper where it was like it was so short and the supplement was like so long <laughs> it was like 50 pages long but there's a bunch of things in there including uh, the, our CPA, so you can see the collaborative practice agreement in there and it includes the induction protocol um and the withdrawal support protocol um, and uh, and the maintenance and then um, definitely definitely different components of that. Um, my colleague Jeff Bratberg had and um, and others are um, kind of putting more together and uh, creating more of a toolkit. So hopefully that will be um, you know vetted and adapted and made a little bit more. We it's not nothing's perfect. This is all just like you have to try it and see how it works for you all and you know shift things around differently. But yeah. Um uh oh Chris you might be on mute. Oh sorry about that. Um yeah just wanted to say thank you and uh, we will um be able to share the links that you provide. We we send out a newsletter every Tuesday. So I think in, in addition to this recording we could send links to um what you included for your links, but we, we could also uh, find a way to share the actual article so that people could see that supplement that may be interested. So thank you yeah. for sharing that. I had one other thought. Um, I've been following all the fun things and uh, amazing things going on in Kentucky. And um, similarly in Massachusetts and Rhode Island, there's some, as I probably in many states um, that mobile health vans and um, access to buprenorphine through mobile vans is something that um, is happening. And um, there is discomfort in having the van be the place of dispensing, right? So it, it's just one of those interesting stories where for every prescription, there needs to be a pharmacy. So the story of a mobile van is still a story of the pharmacy in the end. Um, and even in the story of the ED um, based prescribing is the story of the pharmacy on site who's prescribing or who's dispensing the um, the buprenorphine. And um, so I think there's lots of room in each of these environments to improve um, pharmacy relations, collaborations and um, and support one another. And uh, it's uh, I, I commonly am finding that a mobile health fan is kind of overwhelmed with patients and they're like, oh, what do we do? How do we do? You know, but they have a pharmacy they work really closely with. And this is a model that might really work well, where it's not every pharmacy, and it's but it may be a couple pharmacies that are really trusted and connected to that prescribing pathway where a natural collaboration has already developed. All you're doing is formalizing that and making it more system, more systemic um, and consistent. So when the van goes away, 
the pharmacy can, is still open and there and may, may be a, an opportunity, a opportune place for both continued care. So people um, kind of move from the van in a comfortable way, but also could start if the van's not there. Um, so you end up having a little bit more of a time space continuum for buprenorphine access. But um, these are just a few couple of things that I've been like, even since we, we published this paper, um, taking a look around in our communities of, um, you know, building out the, the capacity to have more um, pharmacy initiated and or pharmacy continued supports. Um, and then last thought I have to say is we had a very unfortunate situation where um, a extraordinarily large buprenorphine provider network um, was um, removed from practice and left over a thousand patients um, without a buprenorphine prescriber. And um, thankfully, you know, collaboration with the state and CDC stepped in and there, were a, there was a lot of um, quickly finding who can do what, <laughs> you know, and it was another reminder that had we had um, even capacity, if not ongoing, but a emergency sort of need that um, in all of our disaster management protocols, you will find a pharmacist and a pharmacy team. Every state has a pharmacy and a pharmacist on that team. These are the disasters that we are creating. We have plenty of tornadoes. We have plenty of other hurricanes and floods and horrible things that happen in our community that we can't control. But when we introduce um, challenges like this, we have an obligation, I think, to plan for the fallout. And this isn't a role where... Um, we haven't yet brought a team together in this way, but it's a possible role where um, through a, a time-based collaborative practice or a time-based protocol exists. And each, unfortunately, there, there will be multiple times where this may happen, where action is taken. And each time is a new way to, another way to build up capacity within a state. Um, and I do believe that there is a volunteer aspect to humanity, <laughs> that we are all on a call like this for a reason, that we're all doing this work because we care. And that is absolutely the case with pharmacists as well. It's not like there's, except for pharmacists, you know, like every healthcare professional that there is a, a want to try to serve and protect and to build um, capacity and safety for our patients and um, and to do no harm. And this is an opportunity, I think, to um, even if it's not every day or it's not on every induction episode, but it's when it's needed that you're there to, to be supportive of patients and um, so that they don't have to suffer. Um, so there are a couple different capacities I didn't speak to in the slides, um, but I felt like it was worthwhile to bring up.